Hey everybody, Grandmaster Ben Feingold with the final day of the St. Louis Blitz. Um, no surprises, Aronian won. Um, Karyaka made a big run for it. He won seven out of eight. No, that's not right. Eight out of nine yesterday. And he won his first two games today. So he was in second. And then after that, he didn't really compete with Levon. So maybe there was a round where he was a point behind Levon, but usually he was two or three points behind. So Levon won pretty handily. Um, this was the only day Kasparov did pretty well, um, but he still came in eighth out of ten players. And um, I think Chess, I mean, he wasn't going to play anyway after this event, but I think this cemented the fact that he's not going to play anymore. And it was disappointing, of course, until today. Today he played some good games. So, um, all right. We don't have a lot of games today because yeah, it's Blitz, so there's a lot of blunders. I like to look at silly blunders because it's funny, but they weren't that silly. They were like a little silly. This is um, Caruana Lequang Lim. Not a good day for Caruana. Um, and this position, strangely enough, although I guess it's not strange if you've used the engine a lot, <laughs> says it's equal. Um, yeah. Um, usually in blitz chess, queens beat pieces because you have to think a little bit to get your pieces coordinated. And black's pieces are really spread out. So what is a passed pawn? So it's not hard to imagine in this position. Uh, well, I, th I thought white made a move. In this position, okay, Black played knight before getting his knight back into the game. And um, uh, here Fabiano made the losing move. Um, he should have played c7 with the idea of c8. And um, after c7, the computer gives some long crazy line that's equal where Black is forced to give up a piece for the passed pawn and then wins a couple of white's pawns and... You get like a rook and a minor piece for a queen with a drawn end game. Um, you would think it would be pretty likely that c7 will be played most of the time by most people because you want to lose your c pawn and you want to queen it. So c7 is the obvious move. A lot of times the super GMs don't play obvious moves. They play other moves. And those moves are better, but not this time. So c7 is the right move. Uh, Fabiano played queen e3, which loses the game. Uh, and this is a very nice move that Lequang played. It's not tactical, it's just it's um, just a very nice move because it does a lot of things. Um, I don't know if Fabiano missed it, probably, because it's a blitz game. Um, attacks the rook and black plays knight d5. So black just played knight a2 to b4 to d5, so knight's great. It's terrible on a2. And um, he's defending the rook and he's stopping the c-pawn. And the queen on e3 is defending the knight on e5. Wow. Okay, and Fabi got lots of pass pawns by taking on a7. Unfortunately, after bishop takes e5, queen takes a8, um, black has this dynamic duo defending against e7. And, um, yeah, the rook and two pieces really beat a queen. And the pawns aren't so dangerous because black's going to take them. And white can get in trouble and get mated because there's a lot of pieces for black. Um, white played f3, I guess, a lot earlier, so if black's bishop ever goes to g3, you're going to get mated. Okay, so Fabiano played a5, makes sense. Rook b4, attacking the b2 pawn, and preparing to play bishop g3, probably, with my mating idea. a6, makes sense. Rook takes b2, a7, and rook a2. It's amazing, the the bishop, knight, and rook stop both of the passed pawns because the black knight can go to c7. Um, also, bishop d4 check is winning the a pawn. So there's just no hope here. Queen b7, bishop d4 check, rook takes a7. So in a slow game, white would resign here. Um, probably white would have resigned instead of playing queen b7 because this is silly. But it's a blitz game, so you don't resign because, you know, nothing's easy. And um, yeah, White just has no counterplay. So eventually he's going to lose a C pawn, and he did. And um, this is a nice move. Uh, this could go in a book of Zwischenzugs, because most Zwischenzugs in books are like taking lots of pieces you know, in between move before you do that. This is just capturing on G6 the way you want to. You would like to take with a knight, because then you have a pawn on F7, your king is safe. If you take with a pawn on F7, your king is... Pretty exposed. 
Obviously, you can't take with a knight because your rook's hanging, so you check first, then take with a knight. Yeah, now the black king's pretty safe. And um, yeah, very good technique from black. Le Quang Lin really played well at this point in the game, and it's just absolutely hopeless. Yeah. And this was a funny moment because after takes takes, um, if you make an error in calculation, you could think that h5 is winning a piece because it attacks the knight, and knight's defending the bishop, but obviously, and Fabiano saw it too. Uh, Rook h4 check just wins the pawn. Okay, and he resigned. So that was a very nice technique because normally in a blitz game, even the best players in the world have trouble coordinating a lot of pieces. And even though the engine likes black, it's easier to move with the queen, especially when white had a lot of passed pawns. So, well, that was really nice from, uh, from McQuang Lee. Okay, too bad for Fabi, who had a bad day. Okay, and somehow it's being all insane. Okay, now it's less insane. Okay, and I'll flip the board. You know why, in case my comer shows up. This is the game, Nepomniachi versus Anand. Uh, I'm purposely pronouncing Nepomniachi incorrectly, so you can say incorrect. So, um, yeah. But anyway, he has a lot of letters in his name. I just call him Nepo. Um, okay, but anyway, this came out of a center game, uh, which is e4, e5, d4. And Anand is black, and he won a pawn pretty quickly, taking the e4 pawn. It's almost theory, this position. Okay, not this position. Okay, so black's up a pawn for nothing. And I really like the way Anand played here. So after queen f4 which really defends the d4 square. No square is more defended. Therefore, Anand played d4. And the engine says that's one of the better moves. Um, it likes b6 also. But I really like d4 because it seems very strange to have thought of such a move because white just defended d4 again and put all his pieces on d4. Black is a pawn ahead. So giving up your extra pawn is weird. Now, of course, white's going to push all his kingside pawns. That's why he castled queenside. So he's going to play g4 and h4 and rar. So since white is not developed very well on the king side, black wants to attack now. And d4 is a textbook example of a clearance sacrifice, something you haven't heard of. And if you did hear of it, you don't know what it is. Okay, And you're lying when you say, yeah, I do. So stop lying. No lying on my channel. Um, so clearance sacrifice, the way I describe it to my students, usually little kids, is you want to capture your own piece, but you're not allowed to. So you'd like to play knight d5, attacking the queen and the bishop, but you can't take your own piece. So you move your piece out of the way. The best example that I know of sacrificing a d-pawn for a clearance is the famous game, which I've lectured on, on chess.com and ICC and my channel and St. Louis Chess Club and... Probably I was like, I broke into your house and I lectured on it because it's such a common game. This is the game Steinitz von Bartelab in Hastings 1895. That's what my wife was thinking. She was like, ooh, me, Steinitz von Bartelab, rawr, that you could probably hear. And uh, this is the one time I've lectured where she's not asleep. It's amazing. Okay, but she's, she's getting there. She's like, ah, oh, it's so boring. Um, so in that game, Steinitz had a knight on f3 and he wanted to play knight d4, which was illegal because he had a pawn on d4, so he played d5. Rawr! And they played knight d4, and they played knife f5. Wow. It's the only good game Steinitz ever played. Yeah. Okay, so uh, d4. Knight takes d4, knight d5. This is very funny because white made a really obvious move here, and it's a, it's a really bad move. So he should move his queen, I think queen e4, I think. And the computer says black is a little bit better. Uh, point two. But he played the move a lot of us would play, knight takes c6. Uh, and this looks like it ruins black's pawn structure. But actually, um, this helps black because your knight's not on d4 anymore. It was their last move. I can prove it. See? And now it's not. So now when the black knight moves away from d5, like taking the bishop, then your rook on d1 is hanging with mate. The engine says this line is very reasonable. And you have a Zwischenzug check. 
and Black's a pawn up for just no compensation. It's a pawn up. It's a center pawn too. Black's going to play d5. So he should have done this because what Nepomniach usually doesn't play the boring line. <laughs> so he played the computer second choice, which I mean, I don't even know if I would have thought of this move, but he played Rick takes d5. Okay. And a non straighten out his pawns and has an extra exchange. So now white has to be down the exchange and lose in a thousand moves. And it's a blitz game, so he might not lose. So he should play bishop d3 and just play chess and be down the exchange. That's life. But he decided to lose instantly. Not a good decision. Play bishop e5, um, which isn't good. Rook e6. And, well, we don't really want what black to play rook e1 check. So he played queen g3, which threatens mate. And it defends e1. So maybe if he stops me, we can take on c7. And a non played rook g6. And bishop a6, which is a really nice move. I, If I was playing a blitz game, I probably wouldn't notice bishop a6 because it doesn't look like it's defended. Normally, I don't have a rook on g6 in front of my g-pawn. So in a blitz game, that's too creative for me. Okay, and then f4, getting some counterplay or pretending to. Um, but he didn't really get any. Yeah, and Anon just went forward. This is actually quite funny. After the, always play king b1. Uh, after the move d4, the bishop on e5 is trapped. The, the truth hurts. Um, I don't know how you're getting it out. I think if you resign, then you, you'll get it out. Yeah, so d4 is a nice move. Queen f1. Not sure why he did that. King h8. So I guess that doesn't make any sense. Ah, well, okay, maybe those guys aren't as bad as I think they are. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. So I'm, I'm wondering why he didn't play f6 now. Maybe Anon knows my rule. So queen c4, the point of queen f1. Obviously, if you take, you play f5 and the rook is pinned. And I was like, we'll move the king now. For example, king h8. Ah, but now we have bishop c7. Man, those guys are good. And our bishop gets out. Aha. Uh -huh. So Anand saw that, obviously, and played king h8. And I didn't know that before I made the video, but now I know why. Yeah, now f6 is winning. So it looks like Nepo should play queen c4. Okay, and he played queen c4. Okay, and ff6, bishop c7. So he played rook e8. I don't think that actually makes sense to me. Man, those guys are good. Okay, now I don't see defense to f6 because um, the bishop's trapped on e5. That's a really weird place to have your bishop trapped in the center. Usually it's trapped on the side. Okay, so Nepo played queen b3, which is it's very funny why he played that <laughs> because after f6, he can play bishop b8. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Okay, and it was, wasn't funny very long. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't... I, I, I think I'm right. I wouldn't bet my life on it, but I would bet a lot of money. Uh, Anon didn't win any games yesterday. So out of nine blitz games, I believe he had three losses and six draws. So it's nice to win a game. So there you go. Anon wins a game with black against, in my opinion, one of the better blitz players, Napomniachi. Okay, and you can pronounce it correctly if you want, but I don't want to do that. Okay, so that was good. Okay, and then card jack and card jack Kasparov will flip the board. I could have left it with black. So the game was about equal most of the game, and then Kasparov got outplayed, and now he's losing. And this is Karyak and Kasparov. Uh, white has two pass pawns, and white has an extra pawn. So white's winning. And Kasparov played e5, and Karyak and blundered. This is a funny blunder because the reason it's a blunder isn't apparent now because it's not possible now. So it's, this is a very common issue that Grandmaster Ken West has, uh, but this is obviously 20 times more complicated. So Ken told me his main blunders in chess, his main ones, not all of them, his opponent makes a very obvious threat, maybe like queen h2 mate, Rookie one mate, some some obvious threat, and then he stops it, okay, because he's Ken West, and then his opponent makes a random move, 
And now there's no threat because he stopped it. So he moves the piece away that defended the threat. And then the guy meets him or, or takes something. And he says, I do that. He told me he does that a lot. Like he stops the threat, then there's no threat. So he lets the guy do whatever he was going to do by moving the piece away that was stopping the threat. That's exactly what happened here, but slightly more complicated, slightly. So uh, Black wants to play knight e2 check, winning the queen. And Karyakin took good care of that. He's like, no, you're not going to do that. And then he untook care of it, because that's English, untook care of. And m my wife has a degree in English or literature, right? So you can agree that untook care of it is, that's, that's good English. Okay, yeah, she gave me the thumbs up or something, some kind of, one of her fingers went up. Okay, so uh, here the engine says Rick takes G8 is like plus 2.5. And the second best move was Rook E4. Wow, Rook E4. Okay, so Karyakin made the losing move, Rook F1, which, man, that looked good to me when I was watching the game. I was like, oh, man, the, wow, that looks good. So, yeah, you run up the Rook and the Queen and the king, so Kasparov playing king e7, getting getting on all, all that nonsense, okay? And actually, black's winning here, so pause your video and find the winning move that Kasparov missed. And we're back. Um, yeah, actually, this was relatively obvious because white wants to take on e5 and win all of black's pieces, and this prevents that forever. Preventing stuff forever is good. e4, and the truth hurts because the rook that was defending e2 is not defending e2, and the bishop that was defending e2, well, it has nowhere to go. So the engine says here and blacks up a piece. Okay, and you can you can have your three pass pawns. Ooh. Okay, so that would be winning for black, and I'm guessing somebody who's more tactically aware and a lot younger and has losing positions a lot and wins them, Nakamura, he would have played e4, and people would have said how lucky he was. Well, you make your own luck. Um, I've lost more games than you've played, and I win a lot of games where I'm losing because I look for tricks when I'm losing. Okay, so Kasparov should have played e4, and probably young Kasparov would have, but this Kasparov was playing sort of scared because he's getting beat, and especially by Karyakin. Wow, Karyakin beating everybody. Man, I'd be scared if I was playing Karyakin. So uh, after rook f1, rook f1 looks good. That looks like crushing black. They play king e7, and he would have won with e4, had a winning position anyway. And Karyakin wants to take on e5, but then there's queen takes g5, so he traded rooks first. Oh, he played queen e3. I thought he traded rooks. He did that next move. King d7. And they traded rooks and took on e5, and black has to play queen e5. And all the commentators were like, yay, white trades queens and has two connected past pawns. Okay, that's because the commentators don't get chess lessons from me. Who did they get chess lessons from? I'm not sure. Um, okay, so Black's thing is on d7, so okay, I can play rook f7 check. Now, I, I'm when I say I'm pretty sure, now that I think about it, I might be wrong. So I guess I'm not, I'm not sure at all. I thought if Kasparov moved his king to d8 or, or c8, that Karyaka would trade queens and have a better version of that endgame because his rook on the seventh rank. But maybe he wouldn't have. Maybe he would have moved his queen and tried to mate him. I don't know. Anyway, Kasparov played king e6, and the idea is if if white trades queens, then black can take with the king and have an active king. You know, maybe king f4, king e3. I don't know. But, yeah, king on e6 is no good, so queen f2. Yeah, you don't trade when you're mating your opponent. Yeah, now, man, that king on e6... I don't know about that. Okay, so the game didn't last very long. Uh, queen g5. Rook takes c7. Now he's up two pawns, and he's threatening queen f7 check, which has to be good. And there's probably other threats I don't see. Spite check. Um, I was espousing bishop f1 because of my rule. Always play bishop f1, but king h2 is obviously better. So you play king h2. And, yeah. Okay, that's, now it's a silly position, and Kasparov resigned. So Karyakin was winning. He allowed Kasparov to play e4, which was winning, and he didn't. Now, we could have a long discussion about the benefits of blitz chess and rapid chess as opposed to slow chess, and um, my wife is telling me it's not a discussion because you guys aren't saying anything, so we'll have a monologue. Um, thanks, dear. So, uh, yeah... 
if you hate draws and you like blunders, you can go to a kid's chess camp. You won't see any draws and you'll see all blunders. However, you guys are masochists. You like when the strong players blunder. That makes you feel better. So when Kasparov and Kramnik and Nakamura and Carlson and Wesley So and MVL, when they blunder, you're like, ah, oh, my computer says this is better. What a terrible player. You like that. Now, if you like that, you're going to like Blitz and Rapid because the less time you have to think, the more you're going to blunder. And then if you like when 2,800 players play perfect every move, then you're going to like slow chess. Um, and we've, I've had this talk already with you on my channel. I think it's good to have both. I think St. Louis got it right. You have the slow tournament, everybody's playing great, and then you have the Blitz and Rapid and everybody's having fun. And when the tournament's over, and probably right now, because the tournament ended like four hours ago, they're probably just playing Bug House all night. Because Bug House, if you lose 40 games in a row, you don't care. If you lose one slow game, you, you don't want to quit chess forever. So it's much more fun for the top players to play Blitz and Bug House because they don't care as much. Um, they still care, but play slow chess, they really care. And... Um, any little mistake loses, and in Buckhouse and Blitz, you can make a mistake every move and win. So it's more fun. So I like both, and I don't want to just see one. I want to see them both, and um, well, we saw them both. So great. And that's why there's a lot of decisive games and a lot of blunders, because they've got no time on their clock. You know, what do you want? Okay. Last game. After my spiel. Kasparov Nakamura. Okay. And ooh, we're going to have Kasparov be white, because he was white. Wow. What's going on here? I hope it's white's move. Otherwise, we're in another dimension. Yes. Okay. So they got this position. Nakamura was fighting, like, in second place, getting close to first, the first five, six rounds today, four rounds, but he lost. At some point, he lost, like, four out of five games. So then he was just fighting for second, and he actually tied for second in the last round. I don't know what the tie breaks were, but it doesn't matter. Um, so he tied with Karyakin for second. Aronian won, and Nakamura and Karyakin got the same score. <sighs> but um, in this position, White's obviously better. White has an extra pawn on both sides of the board. He could take on F2 by playing rookie 2 check, but he's going to lose his F5 pawn. So Nakamura made the practical decision of trading rooks because there's a well-known saying, Bishop opposite colors are draws, and you know what I say, they're always winning. Now, the reason I wanted to look at this game actually has very little to do with, because it's Kasparov and Nakamura, although it has something to do with Nakamura, but not because of, you know, they got paired. Uh, Nakamura yesterday, yesterday? I think it was yesterday. It might have been two days ago. I'm, I'm, it's a blur now. I don't know. I'm starting to think it was in the Rapid. It wasn't in the Blitz, but I don't know anymore. He lost again to the Quan Lim, and the game ended with Bishop versus two pawns, and I, I even talked about it in the video. And it was a draw, and Nakamura had to choose whether to play King E4 or King C3. Also, King C2 drew, but you don't have to know that. Um, and he went the wrong way, and he did it again here which is, I thought was funny, going the wrong way every time. And this time, whoa, I don't blame him for going the wrong way. I would I wouldn't even have thought of the other way. So, there's, And it's a blitz game, so I can't really blame anyway. Okay, so the game continued, King E3. And if you're a student of mine, or you've watched a lot of my videos, or you're good at chess, or you have another chess teacher, or you're lucky, uh, you know that when you're trying to draw an endgame, you want no pawns on the board. I guarantee you, king and bishop cannot be king, no matter what the kids in my kids' class say. So if white doesn't have any pawns, it's a draw. And so black wants to trade all the pawns off, so he played g6. This is actually funny. I, uh, the move Kasparov played isn't the engine move, but I really like it. And the reason is Nakamura has to get his king somewhere, you know, somewhere like where I'm showing you, somewhere. And... If you take on g6, like everybody else in the world do, then would, then the black king gets closer to what I showed you. So Kasparov played h6 because leaving black with a g pawn doesn't matter. G pawn's irrelevant. But he keeps black's king over there. 
Now, obviously, you can't let... Why can't I go backwards? I'm too stupid. What, what, what happened? Oh. I'm still not sure why that didn't work. Oh, well. Um, yeah, you don't want black to take this and get a fast pawn. So, okay, so he took it. He played h6. All right, and then king takes h6, and Kasparov walks his king up. And this is very funny. Uh, he played king h5, and that's the losing move. Now, I'm not saying that he's not losing, but I think he's not losing. I think he's not losing. And the move that draws, if it does draw, is king g7. Wow, who would play king g7? Walking into discovered check. But when white has a king and a pawn on the queen side, black needs to get over there. And king h5, that doesn't get over there. And black doesn't have counter plan on the king side. Those pawns are in dark squares. So king h5 does nothing, but king g7 runs over there. So like, for example, this is the idea, just so you understand. Okay, like this is like one of the ideas. Maybe I should play, no, I think I should take. Okay, we get our king over there. Let's, let's get over there, right? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so, so it actually makes sense now. You can see why we would do this. Although this looks like it's just winning for white. So maybe I, I made a mistake. I make a lot of mistakes. Um, maybe I was supposed to play bishop like e2 here. Yeah, actually, I like bishop e2. I like I like not taking this pawn. Yeah. Yeah, because a5 doesn't seem to work. Even if you played a7, I have bishop f3. Yeah, and then I, I think... Anyway, the computer didn't give some big number. It gives some small number, like 0.3. I mean, if white's going to queen or win the bishop, it's going to be some huge number. But, yeah. So, anyway, this was the drawing chance. I don't know if it draws, but I suspect it does with two engines because after king g7, my engine gave a small number. Um... And usually they can see like 20 moves ahead here because there's no legal moves. And if you see 20 moves ahead here, you know if you're winning. It's not like you're guessing. Um, so king g7 probably draws. Um, and it's a much better chance than king h5 because king g7 runs over to the king to the queen side, which is important. And king h5 is like the obvious move because king g7 is weird. But you're not you're not getting you're not doing anything over there. Yeah. And Kasparov didn't care about his f2 pawn. So he's like, take my f2 pawn, care about that. And, um, yeah. You can imagine if Black's king was over here, this would just be an easy draw. There's no play here even. But now it's an easy win. There's no play here either. And um, Kasparov did something nice here. Um, he played king, bishop, c1. And then he realized if his bishop goes to e3 and c1, the guy can just keep attacking it. So he decided if the bishop was here, that would be the end of that. So he played bishop a3 to go to e7. Um, I mean, g5 is the only chance, but it's no chance because I'll have two pass pawns on opposite sides. So there's no chance. In fact, that reminds me of the game I did look at yesterday, uh, Aronian and Lequang Lim. Aronian was black. He had the two pass pawns on both sides, and Lequang had one, which... Didn't matter because we're going to second bishop for it. So Karo played here and bishop e7, and that's it. There's no counterplay. Uh, I'm going to play b6, king c7, b7. You have to give up your bishop for my pawn, and then this. that's it. So he resigned here. So that was a nice endgame play from Gary. Uh, I like the move h6, even though the computer doesn't, because it's a good human move, and it, it sort of led Hikaru astray. If you take it on g6... I'm reasonably sure Hikari wouldn't have played king h5 from g6. He would have played king f7 because he's already closer to there. So that was, h6 was a really good psychological move. That was good. So Gary played a lot better today. Uh, Hikari probably had his worst day today. Anand had like all bad days. He came in ninth place. Navarro beat a lot of strong players. He still came in 10th, but he was expected to come in 10th. And I guess Dominguez did okay. Caruana, eh. Nipo Miyachi, I think, should have fought for first, but he didn't. I mean, in Rapid and Blitz, he's really good, but uh, the tournament belonged to Aronian. And um, other than the Sinkfield Cup, uh, man, I'm starting to doubt even whether he played. I'm getting so confused. I'm mixing all these tournaments up. But other than that, like if he didn't play, then I'm looking bad over here. But... I mean, Aronian's been, been killing it. Like, he's having a great year. He won this tournament easily. He won a lot of other tournaments. And, um, 
Yeah, not only did he play in the Singfield Cup, he got to number two in the world. So I'm starting to think he won it now. Oh, MVL won the Singfield Cup, and I guess Aronian was second. No, he lost in the last round to Carlson. Now it's all coming back to me. You see, these videos aren't edited. Uh, yeah, in fact, he would have tied for first if he had beaten Carlson in the last round. He lost. That's like his only blemish, like, the whole year as he lost in the last round with Black to Carlson. Otherwise, man. And I think he is number two in the world in slow chess. And now he's winning the Rapid and Blitz, and he's winning a lot of other tournaments, and he's getting married soon, which they announced on the broadcast. Um, he's been dating... In fact, I thought maybe they were married. It was unclear to me. Um, but they're getting married for sure now. Um, Ariane Keoli, who's a WIM. Yeah. All right, that was the Singfield Cup and this St. Louis Rapid and Blitz over the last five days. Very exhausting. N now what do we do? There's no there's no more chess there. So it's, I guess we'll have to wait for my chess center to open. Um, we spent a lot of money today uh, buying stuff for the chess center. So give us your money. And then um, we'll have a nicer chess center. Uh, follow me on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Like and subscribe here on YouTube. Go to our website, atlchessclub.com. An even better website is atlchessclub.com slash donate. And if you want to play in our tournaments, um, atlchessclub.com slash events. And now on our, our homepage, you can see a funny picture of Yasser, and you can see uh, our upcoming events. Our next few events are on the homepage now. So stay tuned for more updates, and if you follow me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, you can see a lot of pictures of the new chess club. We open in September 9th. See everybody then. Bye-bye.